police started lining up outside the church around 1.30 this afternoon. The doors weren't open, however, until 2.30, and the church is absolutely filled to capacity. The church holds 1,400 people, and all 1,400 seats are occupied at this moment. The configuration here at First Community, Roy, is one of a cross, and at the wings of the cross, which go to the sides of the, of the uh, front of the church, are filled with primarily former OSU football players and coaches. And let me tell you, there are hundreds of them here today, people that probably have hundreds of woody stories to tell as well. And I know that you met many of them that you were in school with. Quite a few of them have come back from the mid-60s, from 62 through 67. And now I think the services are about to begin. Steve and Kathy and all of Woody's family, we welcome you to this very special occasion when we honor this uncommon man. Special memories which gathered about his life, and there are so, so many of them. We thank you for his dedication to that in which he believed. The belief that in every single human soul, often there was more than even that person knew. And how much he wanted to bring out the very best in every human person. deeply missed by all of us here today and by many others across this great nation. He'd be remembered as a father and a husband, a coach, a loyal member of the Ohio State University family, a mentor, a benefactor, a truly great man. He was all these things and many more, a complex man certainly, and on one who earned our respect, admiration, and love. Next, we would hear from the one who honors us with his presence and honors Woody as well, the former President of the United States, the Honorable Richard Nixon. I first met Woody Hayes 30 years ago. Uh, it was after the Ohio State-Iowa football game at Ohio Stadium. Incidentally, for those of you who are football fans, you've never been to a football game until you've been to one at Ohio Stadium. The final score was 17 to 13, and Woody has won his second national championship. And that evening, John Bricker gave a reception, a victory reception at his home, and I first met Woody Hayes. Well, I wanted to talk about football. And Woody wanted to talk about foreign policy. <laughs> well, you know Woody, we talked about foreign policy. <laughs> Over the next 30 years, I got to know the real Woody Hayes, the man behind the media myth. I found that he was not the Neanderthal, know-nothing that some people thought of him, but that he was a Renaissance man, a man with a great sense of history and with a profound understanding of the great forces that moved the world. I found that instead of being just that tyrant that you sometimes see on the football field, that he was actually a softy, a warm-hearted man. He often spoke to me about his boys, as he used to call them and of his affection for them 
and for his family. And if I were to share with you a letter that he wrote to me shortly after Mrs. Nixon had a stroke 10 years ago. He said, you and I are about the two luckiest men in the world from the standpoint of marriage with your Pat and my Ann. I know you will agree that neither of us could have done better and neither of us deserves to do so well. You must, must remember that Woody knew there were risks. After all, there is a rule of life. If you take no risks, you will suffer no defeats. But if you take no risks, you will win no victories. Woody was not one that would play it safe. He played to win. And in the next nine years, he won some great victories. Six straight Big Ten championships from 1972 to 1977. And he suffered some shattering defeats. The incident at the Gator Bowl in 1978 would have broken, crushed an ordinary man. But Woody was not an ordinary man. Winston Churchill has written that success is never final and that failure is never fatal. That was Woody Hayes' maxim. He was never satisfied with success and he would never be discouraged by failure. You look back at the nine last years of his life, they were probably his greatest. He traveled all over the country, inspiring audiences with his fine speeches. And the honorariums that he received, thousands and thousands of dollars, he gave to the Woody Hayes Cancer Fund at Ohio State University. And then on his birthday, this compassionate man born on Valentine's Day, appropriately. He had a program where thousands of dollars were raised in a, what, were, what was called a phonathon and given for crippled children. And so Woody, having done these things, he also kept his hand in football. You would see pictures of him giving pep talks to the Ohio State football team that he loves so much, now coached by one of his boys, Earl Bruce. And in those last years, he basked in the warm glow of tributes from those who had played under him and many others who had come to know him and to respect him and to love him. When we think of Woody's background and what he accomplished, I think it is important to know that at the end of his life, just last year, he received what I think was his greatest tribute. The National Coaches Association for high schools and colleges gave him their highest honor the Amos Alonzo Stagg Award. They honored him for being an outstanding coach. But even more important, they honored him for being a great humanitarian. 2,000 years ago, the poet Sophocles wrote, one must wait until the evening to see how splendid the day has been. All of us can be thankful that Woody Hayes, in the evening of his life, could look back and see how splendid the day had been.
For the people of Newcomer's Town, it was probably a common sight. Ike and Woody, horsing around by the mill pond, doing what brothers do, wrestling in the grass, catching frogs, skipping rocks across that glass smooth water. Somewhere, sometime in that sleepy little town east of Columbus, these two characters picked up the inside track on human values. They learned integrity is the essence of character. They learned courage is the conqueror of fear. And they learned people are more important than power. And thus, crediting their parents for this phenomenal base, they began to work variations on the theme. Ike would go on to become an All-American football player at Iowa State University. And Woody would go on to become one of the most successful coaches in the history of the game. Their last great moment together came in 1955 when Ike took out a second mortgage on his home in Waterloo, Iowa in order to take the whole family to Pasadena for the Rose Bowl where he would watch his brother win his first national championship as the Buckeyes defeated Southern Cal 20 to 7. And just 25 days later, Ike would succumb to a heart attack at the age of 43. So Woody was left with the memory of a best friend who happened to be his brother and a tremendous legacy to fulfill. And Woody did it. His most recent book, the rabbi Harold Kushner suggests that the passing of a man is akin to the tossing of a stone into a still pond. At first there is this big splash around the death and then the ripples begin to tumble one on the other as friends recall stories, anecdotes, quotes, experiences. But all too soon, the ripples fade, and the stranger asks, what difference did this man make? Today, we are gathered to honor the memory of one whose life made a phenomenal difference. It'll be a long time before his ripples still. And even then, Woody Hayes will be remembered as the quintessential blend of pride and principle. The masses knew him as a tenacious tactician, a competitive mastermind who loved the battle and lived for the win. But we, we knew a little bit more than the masses. And even as we gather here to honor him today, I think we would be remiss if we did not take a moment to say thank you to that family that practiced the grace